Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Megan Lovett and I serve the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry as Director of Continuing Education. Thanks to each of you for joining us today for our 12th annual Mary Magdala celebration. Since 2009, the School of Theology and Ministry has hosted an annual celebration on or near the feast day of St. Mary Magdala on July 22nd. Inspired by the role of Mary Magdalene being the first to proclaim the news of Christ's resurrection, this event includes a liturgical celebration, as well as a lecture by a distinguished scholar on various topics highlighting the legacy of women in the church. This celebration first came about through the recommendation of Rita Houlihan. We are grateful to Ms. Houlihan for providing the financial support for this event, which honors all women in the church. She has also generously gifted several of these beautiful Mary Magdalene proclaims plaques to today's speaker and our CE team. She is with us virtually today, and I would like to take this moment to recognize her for her inspiration and tremendous support. Rita, thank you. These plaques are also available for purchase, and we will include a link in the chat for those that are interested. As part of the mission of the School of Theology and Ministry, the Continuing Education Program offers an array of enrichment opportunities to foster Christian faith and promote lifelong learning. We do this by offering presentations such as this one, as well as online courses, videos, podcasts, and other resources for personal enrichment and professional development. Our summer courses are underway. Our final two summer courses begin on August 4th. These two courses are the Gospel of John and our new course, St. Mary of Magdala. There are a few spots left in these courses. So if you're interested, there's still time to enroll. Please visit our website at bc.edu slash crossroads for more information. We will also include a link in the chat. Thanks to our speaker for granting us permission to record today's webinar. As soon as the recording of today's presentation is available for viewing, likely within a month, we will notify all registered participants of the availability of the recording. At the end of the presentation, there'll be an opportunity for question and answer. Please feel free to enter a question into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Finally, we are also able to offer live closed captioning for today's webinar. You will notice the closed captioning button on the bottom of your screen to enable or disable the feature. You may also move the text to different areas of your screen if you, were, if you wish. Many thanks to Julia and Amanda, graduate students here at the STM for assisting with the closed captioning today. I now invite Father Thomas Stegman, Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Megan. Good afternoon to everyone and a warm welcome to today's presentation. Run, Sister Run, the figure of Mary Magdalene in the Negro spiritual. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker. Dr. M. Sean Copeland is Professor Emerita of Systematic Theology in the Theology Department here at Boston College. She's an internationally recognized scholar and award-winning writer. Professor Copeland received her PhD in systematic theology from Boston College with a dissertation on the notion of the human good in the thought of the Jesuit theologian and philosopher uh, Bernard Lonergan. Before returning to Boston College in 2003 as a faculty member, she taught at St. Norbert College at Yale Divinity School and at Marquette University, which is where I had the pleasure to first meet Sean years ago. In addition, she served for 12 years as an adjunct faculty member of the Institute for Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University in New Orleans. Dr. Copeland lectures frequently on college and university campuses on topics related to theological anthropology, political theology, social suffering, gender and race. And at the same time, she's widely recognized as one of the most important influences in North America in drawing attention to issues surrounding African American Catholics. Dr. Copeland is the author and or editor of six books, including Knowing Christ Crucified, The Witness of African American Religious Experience, which was published uh, three years ago, and In Fleshing Freedom, Body, Race, and Being, published in 2010. She's written over 130 articles, book chapters, and essays on spirituality, theological anthropology, political theology, social suffering, gender, and race. During this past academic year, uh, Professor Copeland served as distinguished 
a visiting professor in the Alonso L. McDonald chair on the life and teachings of Jesus and their impact on culture at Candler School of Theology in Emory University, Atlanta. And I'm just letting you know, I'm sporting the <laughs> colors. Um, we are very delighted to have Professor Copeland with us today at the 12th annual Mary of Magdala celebration. Sean's a great friend of the school and we're in for a, uh, a delightful presentation. Welcome, 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 Sean. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dean Stegman. Uh, and thank you for your kind invitation and for your friendship. My thanks also to Megan Lovett, Director of the Continuing Education um, Area here at the School of Theology and Ministry at Boston College. Uh, Ms. Lovett followed through with me over the past 13 or 15 months, the bumpy, unprecedented time. I'm grateful also to uh, uh, Kara Sullivan, Assistant Director of Continuing Education for her helpful comments and observations during our dress rehearsals. And I'm very grateful to uh, Barbara Bazura and James Burston for technical assistance uh, that they have generously provided in helping me with the PowerPoint. Any bloopers will be mine. Finally, uh, let me uh, not uh, hesitate to thank uh, Rita Houlihan, uh, whose generosity has made these various annual Mary Magdalene lectures possible. And finally, I want to give a word of thanks to Melinda Donovan, uh, former director of continuing education, who invited me at least three years ago to think about Mary Magdalene from an African-American religious and cultural perspective. And finally, thanks to all of you who have joined us uh, this afternoon. The image of Mary Magdalene running to bring good news from heaven prompts this reflection on her presence in the Negro or African-American spiritual. We shall proceed in uh, four stages. First, a summary of the historical and religio-cultural context within which the spirituals were forged. Then consider how in spite of being forbidden by law and custom to attain literacy, the enslaved people encountered the Christian Bible and reframed it as an oral text. Third, we will discuss how the enslaved people came to make the spirituals the preeminent window into their religious and aesthetic consciousness, their experiences and virtuosity. And finally, we focus on Mary Magdalene, listen to a few spirituals that sing of her and engage her presence in one of Titus Kafar's paintings from the series, Disrupted Histories. So the historical and uh, religio-cultural setting uh, of the Negro spiritual. To borrow a phrase from John Lovell, the foremost scholar of the spirituals, the Negro or African-American spiritual was hammered out on the anvil of chattel slavery. Having been sold or kidnapped or betrayed and forced march to the Atlantic coast, various peoples of the African continent found themselves chained in dark and foul dungeons, then herded onto slave ships and shackled below deck, bound for another world. Once out to sea, children, youth, women and men endured filth, handling, severe beatings, torture, sexual assault, and immeasurable psychic trauma. Statistics suggest that 15 to 30% of the captives died in the Middle Passage. From Boston in New England to Montevideo in the Vice Royalty of La Plata, writes Rachel Harding, the African found them, Africans found themselves scattered throughout the Americas, quote, in gold mining towns in central Brazil, on sugar plantations in Jamaica and Cuba, in the coffee producing hills of Venezuela, on cotton and indigo estates in the southern regions of the USA, and in homes, streets, rivers, fields, and even small factories everywhere in between, Africans and their descendants in generations of bondage encountered and helped to create the new world." Close quote. Cut off from the category human, deprived of personal liberty, denied political and legal rights, 
the enslaved people endured continual threat of psychological and bodily violation. The various forms of enslavement that they confronted aimed to control, possess, and dominate, and just as often sought to reduce incarnate spirit to mortgageable property, merchandise, fungible objects. Thus, the enslaved people had to wrestle with the tension between their commodified reduction and their own sense of who they actually were. To negotiate this tension, they reconfigured their religio-cultural worldviews, asserting their humanity in an inhuman situation. If, as Charles H. Long, the historian of religions, explains, if religion is the capacity of human consciousness to apprehend and to signify ultimate meaning and ultimate value symbolically, close quote, then religion is entwined in the structure of human consciousness and human beings possess a natural and innate tending toward transcendence, toward the transcendent, toward God. For the peoples of the continent of Africa, whether Ashanti or Bakongo, Bini or Dahomean, Fante, Fulani, Igbo, Mende, Wolof, Yoruba, and others, African traditional or indigenous religions were distinctive and particular. Yet these religions coalesce as innate tending toward transcendence. Thus, among these people, religion permeated every domain of human life, and the universe radiated and mediated powers and forces of the sacred, a supreme deity, lesser divinities and spirits. These people set no formal limits or rigid distinction between the sacred and the secular, between the spiritual and the material. The whole person and the whole of a person's daily living were suffused with religious significance. African traditional or indigenous religions neither proclaim nor exegete scriptures, neither require nor profess dogmas that demand assent and obedience. Rather, religion, this tending toward transcendence, is inscribed on people's hearts and minds through oral histories, stories, poetry, song, ritual, dance, drumming, ceremonial practices, and religiously endowed persons. Thus, survivors of the Middle Passage did not meet the New World bereft of religion and tradition, history and culture, virtue and morality. Insofar as the enslaved peoples remembered, recollected, fused and improvised fragments of traditional practices and rituals, customs and mores, over time, they developed what I would call root paradigms. Here I'm following uh, Victor Turner, the anthropologist. But root paradigms, cognitive and moral orientations, rites and rituals, aesthetic sensibilities and cultural mores. These were synthesized to ground collective and individual religious consciousness that differed necessarily from their indigenous antecedents. These root paradigms form the first stratum of a worldview that encounters and critically re-envisions Christian preaching and practice in the traumatizing experience of chattel slavery. The Bible as oral text. Prior to the first great awakening, roughly 1730 to 1755, and the evangelizing missions of Baptists and Methodists, the enslaved people show interest in Christianity. Because it was forbidden to enslave Christians, slaveholders initially were reluctant to baptize the enslaved Africans. But some slaveholders proposed that baptism could shape the enslaved people to docility, to an acceptance of their fate as divinely ordained. And to this end, the Bible was used to legitimate and to sacralize perpetual bondage. The ambiguity of slaveholders toward the religious lives of their human property is well documented. Slaveholders attempted to control the enslaved people's every gesture of personal or interpersonal 
or cultural independence. And many even monitored the people uh, during prayer and worship. On some plantations, the enslaved people attended white churches, sitting or standing in designated areas. While on others, other plantations, they were permitted to hold unsupervised praise meetings that were sometimes led by an enslaved preacher. In other situations, the people withdrew to woods and gullies and thickets called brush arbors or hush arbors to pray and sing. Alice Sewell told her WPA Works Project Administrator, Administration, her WPA interviewer, that many people in her area, quote, used to slip off in the woods on Sunday evening, way down in the swamps, to sing and pray to our own liking, close quote. In such tentative but electric privacy, the enslaved people created spirituals, reconfigured African customs and spiritual practices of shouting, moaning, and dance, experienced spirit possession, and not infrequently prepared for escape and strategized rebellion. Not surprisingly, the enslaved people turned an unfavorable eye on Christianity as practiced by the slaveholders, as well as their agents and collaborators. Again, slave narratives preserve the following account by a formerly enslaved man. Quote, I have often heard select portions of the scriptures read. On Sunday, we always had one sermon prepared expressly for the colored people. So great was the similarity of texts that they are always fresh in memory. Servants, be obedient to your masters, not with eye service or men or men pleasers. He that knoweth his master's will and doeth it not shall be beaten with many stripes. Verses of this type. One very kind-hearted clergyman was very popular with the colored people. But after he preached a sermon from the Bible that it was the will of heaven from all eternity that we should be slaves and our masters be our owners, many of us left, considering like the doubting disciple of old, this is a hard saying, who can bear it, close quote. The enslaved people were prohibited de jure and de facto from learning to read and or to write. Those people who dared and were discovered reading or writing were whipped, sometimes mutilated by having a finger cut off. But the people persisted, often with the help of an enslaved person who surreptitiously had learned to read or with the assistance of a free black person or a white person willing to defy legislation and custom. With or without such help, the people took confidence in their own ingenuity and mnemonic skill. They listened intently during public readings of the Bible and sermons. Some among them memorized chapters or portions of the Bible. These spoken fragments and passages became material for their meditation, reflection, sermonizing, and song. In this way, the enslaved people developed a tradition of African-American interpretation. Hebrew Bible scholar Renita Weems argues that, quote, since slave communities were illiterate, they were therefore without allegiance to any official text, any official translation or interpretation. Hence, once they heard biblical passages read and interpreted to them, they in turn were free to remember and repeat in accordance with their own interests and tastes. For those raised within an aural culture, retelling the Bible became one hermeneutical strategy and resistance to the Bible or portions of it would become another, close quote. The enslaved people created what womanist theologian Dolores Williams calls, quote, an oral text, close quote, a life-affirming canon. The composition of this oral text was a communal process from among biblical texts preached in sermons or passages read aloud at white family prayers, members of the enslaved community apprehended, evaluated, judged, and selected life-affirming texts. These passages or stories or sayings were memorized, repeated, reshaped, and purged of racist inferences. 
the resulting oral text was judged to be the true word of God in the Bible. Truly, African-American Christian faith came by hearing, critical listening with the ear, the mind, and the heart. Indeed, biblical revelation provided the enslaved people with material for the singular mystical and political mediation of their condition, the spiritual. The poet and literary critic James Weldon Johnson believed that many spirituals were the work of highly gifted individuals whom in a celebrated poem he called, quote, black and unknown bards, close quote. On the other hand, novelist, folklorist, and anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston maintained that the spirituals are, quote, Negro religious songs sung by a group and a group bent on expression of feelings and not on sound effects, close quote. In his magisterial study of the spirituals, Lovell traces 375 years of the existence of the Negro or African-American spiritual, reckoning that the enslaved people probably composed roughly 6,000 songs, including variants, although he refers to or cites directly more than 500. So we only ever hear a very slim portion of spirituals, a very slim portion. When asked about their method of composing their religious songs, songs, enslaved men and women often reply, quote, the Lord just put them in our mouth. The Lord puts every word we say in our mouth, close quote. One formerly enslaved woman from Kentucky insisted that the spirituals were formed from the material of traditional African tunes and familiar songs. Here's her description of the process by which a spiritual was made. We older folks would make them up on the spur of the moment after we wrestled with the spirit and come through. They call them spirituals because the Holy Spirit revealed them to us. Some folks say that Master Jesus taught them to us, but I have seen them start in prayer meetings. We would be at the praise house on Sunday and the white preacher would explain the word Read where Ezekiel say, dry bones going to live again. And honey, the Lord would come shining through those pages and revive this old woman's heart. I would jump up then and there and shout and sing and clap. And the others would catch the words and they would all take up the words and keep adding to it. And then it would be a spiritual. Close quote. A spiritual is a song or moaned utterance, a chant of an enslaved African American in response to or about a given religious or ordinary social experience that held communal or universal significance. In and through song, one woman's or man's experience of sorrow, shout of jubilation became that of a people. But without a doubt, the spirituals are gifts of the spirit. In creation and performance, these songs are marked by flexibility, spontaneity, and improvisation. A pattern of call and response allowed for rhythmic weaving or manipulation of time, text, and pitch. While the response or repetitive chorus provided a recognizable and stable foundation for the extemporized lines of the soloist or leader. The vocabulary of the spirituals is intensely poetic and expressive, decorative, that's Zoraniel Hurston's were decorative and poignant. That language is characterized by vivid simile, personifications, and creative and effective juxtaposition of images and metaphor. The spirituals may sound simple, but they are not simplistic. They possess what African-American Catholic liturgist and priest Clarence Joseph Rivers called, quote, magnitude, close quote. Spirituals provide a window on the religious, social, aesthetic, and psychological worldview of a people. At the same time, historian Vincent Harding encourages us, quote, the spirituals are available to all persons who are prepared to open themselves to the unsettling healing power that inhabits these marvelous songs of life. 
These songs were created out of deeply meaningful, archetypally human experiences, relevant not only to the specific circumstances of slavery, but also to women and men struggling with issues of justice, freedom, and spiritual wholeness in all times and places." Close quote. Singing Mary Magdalene. On Lovell's account, the enslaved poets and singers drew song pictures of 24 people found in the Hebrew Bible, three of whom are women, Eve, Pharaoh's daughter, and Delilah. Not counting Jesus, who is the heartbeat of the spirituals, 14 people are included from the New Testament, four of whom are women. Miriam of Nazareth, or Mary, the mother of Jesus, the sisters from Bethany, Mary and Martha, and Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene appears 13 times in the New Testament, and chiefly in spirituals that celebrate the resurrection. These songs honor Mary as the first witness to the resurrection, the one whom Jesus sends to announce his vindication to his other disciples and to direct them to meet him in Galilee. The makers of the spiritual invest Mary with qualities or attributes important to them in their condition. We may find some of those qualities or attributes in four resurrection spirituals. First, the angel rolled the stone away. He arose. Mary rolled the stone away. And run, Mary, run. So, the angel rolled the stone away. In this spiritual, the enslaved poets assume that Mary has been in heaven, literally and metaphorically. Sister Mary comes running from heaven with good news that the angel has rolled the stone away. Interpreting the song metaphorically, Lori Ramey proposes two readings of this verse, that Mary may have felt as if she were in a heavenly place when she learned that Jesus had risen. Alternatively, Mary actually might have gone to heaven, either in the body or out of the body, or in a dream state. Both these readings find support in biblical narratives and in the religious experience 
of the enslaved people. Biblical examples include the dream in which Jacob climbs a ladder higher and higher to heaven. This is Genesis 28, 12, or Paul's confession of being, quote, caught up in the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, close quote. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. So these readings are supported in biblical narratives and in the religious experiences of the enslaved people. We can find similar experiences of being caught up in uh, conversion narratives related by emancipated, emancipated people who say quite factually that, quote, God struck me dead with his power, close quote, or that at God's command, their souls have traveled to heaven or to hell and back again. Indeed, dream consciousness was believed by the enslaved community to be a metaphysical gift from God that had placed the one experiencing conversion outside of the temporal self for the purpose of contemplation. This spiritual evokes the Johannine narrative of the resurrection. Mary comes to the garden alone in the fading darkness without any materials for anointing the body of Jesus. She sees the empty tomb, then runs to Peter and the beloved disciple. Mary speaks to the men, but the men do not speak to her. Peter and the beloved disciple run to the tomb. They want to see for themselves. Not finding Jesus, they go away. Mary remains. She stands weeping in the dawning light when she encounters the risen Jesus and instinctively reaches out to touch him. Johannine scholar Alan Callahan makes a very interesting point, arguing that the correct rending, quote, of John 20, 17 is not, don't touch me, but stop touching me, close quote. In other words, Mary already is holding on to Jesus, now weeping tears of shock and joy. Jesus says, stop touching me because he has a mission for Mary. He sends her to the terrified disciples who are hiding behind locked doors in a room in Jerusalem. All too often, like Mary, Enslaved women found themselves standing in tears, weeping at the sale of a child or spouse or parent, weeping at the sight of a slave coffle passing by, weeping at the torture or murder of a loved one by an overseer. And all too often, like Mary, enslaved women found themselves standing in front of locked doors, locked minds and hearts, silenced voices. And like Mary, they persisted in their efforts to break through opposition, to speak up and to speak out, to act, to fight. Our next spiritual, He Arose. Spirit born, he arose, he arose, he 
tells the resurrection story in a quite straightforward manner, relying on accounts from the Synoptic Gospels, particularly those of Mark and Matthew. It reports miraculous action. Down came an angel and rolled the stone away. Just then, Mary enters the scene, weeping, seeking Jesus. And rather than repeat the line, O Mary came a-weeping her Savior for to see, the enslaved poet introduces another idea. The Lord had gone to Galilee. Here, the spiritual concurs with the synoptics on the new spatial location of the body of the risen Jesus, Galilee. In the geography of the spirituals, Galilee most often refers to the home country of Jesus, his disciples, his followers. The line, the Lord has gone to Galilee, may well suggest a place of new life and freedom, a refuge from the necro power or death-dealing power of the plantation. Or perhaps this line is a subtle warning or a signal for escape. The enslaved singer stands hopeful for freedom, release from bondage. A formerly enslaved woman, Ellen Butler, stated that the people sang and prayed for freedom. Alice Sewell agreed. She declared that the enslaved people, quote, prayed to God that if we don't live to see freedom, please let our children live to see a better day and be free. Close quote. The Gullah-speaking people of the Sea Islands that extend along the coast of South Carolina and Georgia exemplify and retain African traditions of creativity in shaping, preserving, and transmitting their religio-cultural life. Their moving hall singers, led by Miss Janie Hunter, sing Mary Roll the Stone Away, not in concertized manner, like the Fisk Jubilee singers who just performed uh, He Arose, but in a style evocative of the original singing in which the leader lines out the words to a song or hymn. If you feel like clapping at home or with your friends on this, please just go for it. In Mark's Gospel, Mary Magdalene, along with three companions, bring along embalming 
paraphernalia to wash and treat the body of Jesus. As they walk, the women wonder aloud, who will roll the stone away for us? Peering through the murky dawn, the women see that the stone has been rolled away. The spiritual credits Mary Magdalene with rolling away the stone. Indeed, before the angel can arrive, Mary has taken care of business. Recall Jesus' words, Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. It's Mark eleven twenty three. Mary moves that very large stone through loving faith. She believes in Jesus and she loves him. Mary's ardent and powerful love rolled the gray stone away in their imagination. Enslaved women at great physical and psychic cost pitted themselves against threats and obstacles for the sake of their children. An emancipated woman, Fanny Moore, told her interviewer that on the plantation where she and her family were held, the overseer, quote, hated my mother, close quote, because her mother would fight with him whenever he tried to beat Fanny and her siblings. Like Mary, enslaved women moved obstacles, pushed aside stones of every sort that physically or mentally sought to hinder their objectives. These women did not wait for someone else to come along, but acted. Turning from the spirituals to a painting by the African-American artist Titus Kafar. This painting is a part of a series, Disrupted Histories. Art critic Priscilla Frank observes that Kafar conjures a space somewhere between here and gone, past and present, traditional and contemporary. Looking at the painting, we recognize it, even as it intentionally trips us up. Here, Kafar practices what he calls, quote, amending, close quote. He has amended Bartolome Esteban Murillo's painting of the crucifixion. Visual memory nudges us to fill in the identities of the figures, the crucified Jewish rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, his mother, Miriam, his dear friends, John and Mary Magdalene. The painting has been amended. The facial features of those at the foot of the cross are erased, hollowed out, washed in cloudy blue. The only distinctly featured face is black and androgynous. This figure looks directly at us, peers through the body of Jesus. Kafar rewriting, amending the picture, allows us to see the continuing history of the enslaved people and their descendants. For that history seeps into the present, into the future present that is our dreadful now. For once again, we are, quote, lynching the Son of God and holding him in contempt. Hebrews 6, 6. Can we see ourselves in the figures at the foot of this lynching tree? Can we grasp the meaning of our silence, our indifference, our complicity and oppression? Even if we are among those who watch and witness, what are we to do? How are we to stand up, speak up, speak out? Gaffar's aim, quote, is to reveal something of what has been lost and to investigate the power of a rewritten history, close quote. His aim corresponds to that of the spirituals, to reveal what and who had been lost, to sing the power, and to sing the rewriting of history, to create new narratives. The spirituals challenge all humankind to openness, self-transcendence, and fidelity to divine love, to eradication of injustice, to sowing seeds of possibility of the reign of God. The spirituals are a reminder that freedom and flourishing is the intention of the divine for each creature, for each human person. These songs teach us that Christian living is inconsistent with powerlessness, dehumanization, hate, and deprivation. The spirituals we've heard today sing Mary Magdalene, whose love could not be quenched, could not be swept away. Mary Magdalene shows us that love is stronger than death, that love can roll gravestones away, and that the flames of love are the fiercest of all fires, moving between earth and heaven, blazing a path to transformation, to freedom, and flourishing. 
Thank you very much for listening. We're going to transition to question and answer now. And um, before we dive in, there was a question about purchasing Dr. Copeland's books in the Q&A. And so uh, we are going to send an, a follow-up email and we'll include some links if you're interested in purchasing. And I wanted to give you the opportunity, Dr. Copeland, if you wanted um, to plug any particular books on this topic or any particular musicians um, for our audience. Well, um, we're always happy to sell books. <laughs> All academics are. Uh, I appreciate uh, Dean Stegman mentioning uh, Knowing Christ Crucified, which uh, has a section on the spirituals, and I appreciate um, his mentioning In Fleshing Freedom. Most recently, Lori Cassidy and I have co-edited a book entitled Desire, Darkness, and Hope, Theology in a Time of Impasse, Engaging the Thought of Constance Fitzgerald, uh, the Carmelite uh, sister uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. And we think that this uh, collection of essays, both of Sister Fitzgerald's and of uh, seven other different, seven other theologians would be of great interest to people interested in social justice and uh, spirituality. Thank you very much for that opportunity. Yes, thank you, Dr. Copeland. And another participant just added, um, you know, a, a list of the authors would be helpful. So thank you. That was a, that was a great list. Um, just a lot of people expressing their thanks for, for your presentation and the inspiration and insights that you have brought to us today. One of the questions, um, because spirituals paint pictures of Mary Magdalene and separately of Martha and Mary of Bethany, is it accurate to say that enslaved persons did not accept the conflation of Mary Magdalene, the sinner from the city, and Luke 7 and Mary Bethany? Were those two separate scriptural figures? It's very difficult to know um, what you're asking. Uh, they often conflate uh, characters and events. The spirituals often do that. They are rewriting uh, a narrative that meets their condition. And um, it, we've come through hit, uh, critical historical scholarship to appreciate uh, the distinctions between Mary of Bethany, Mary Magdalene, um, but there's still a lot of fuzziness. And uh, w this is without uh, diminishing Mary Magdalene and her importance. Uh, but, uh, but what's also true, I think, is that there's also this unnamed woman who shows up in the Gospel of Luke who anoints Jesus' feet. Uh, she shows up in other Gospels as well. We don't know who these people are. Um, but uh, Mary Magdalene obviously had means. The women that Luke names in uh, those verses early on in his gospel, he names the women who are following Jesus, and she's included. And they are providing for his ministry. They're funding his ministry. And uh, she obviously had some means. So um, the other thing about, uh, about sin and sinning, there are some sins that I guess... Uh, people are really interested in and some that people are not. And I think Jesus is uh, not to turn Jesus into plastic Jesus uh, made over in our image and likeness because there are many challenging passages in, in the New Testament. Uh, I've come to bring fire, uh, you know, uh, on the earth. Uh, this kind of challenge to us. So uh, the, the enslaved people, remember, they've got a slim text. Uh, Lovell will say that the Bible of the spirituals is not the Bible of the theologian, the Bible of the ordinary Christian. It's a thin Bible because they're looking for what affirms them. They're looking for what affirms them uh, in God's uh, connection with them. Um, I tell students frequently, if you're so distressed about God, if you think that God is sending you suffering and pain, then get another God. And uh, the, the point for, for these people, they did get another god. They already had their own gods. But, and I, I don't believe the gods didn't make the, the travel across the ocean. But, uh, but, but they really met this other god that was very powerful, that had them in bondage. Could they convert this god to their cause? They succeeded. They succeeded. All you have to do is listen to Go Down Moses, and you know they succeeded. That's a very roundabout answer to your question, but. Thank you, Dr. Copeland. I think we have time for one more. 
Um, so this participant would love to learn to hear more about the imagery and possible reality of Mary being in heaven and on earth, since Jesus and Mother Mary, the only other people to be bodily assumed to he into heaven, it's even more powerful to imagine Mary Magdalene participating in the journey between heaven and earth in an embodied way. This is a part of trying to understand this um, in terms of dream consciousness. And um, I'm, not a, I'm not a Freudian at all. Uh, neither were the enslaved people, but they had a lot of, uh, the, the people making the spirituals had a lot of um, nous, a lot of mind, a lot of intelligence about how the human psyche worked. And so no one's projecting Mary Magdalene to be bodily in heaven. I certainly am not uh, in this presentation. But the spiritual says she came running from heaven. Had she been there is the question. And they're assuming she had. Uh, she was very much alive. She came running there to bring on the good news. So uh, it, it becomes, uh, yes, imagery. It becomes the juxtaposition that's creative of um, what we know to be factual and what people can imagine. And if you do Hollywood movies, you know that we human beings can imagine a lot. These people imagined a great deal, and they did so uh, uh, with a desire uh, to experience uh, transcendence and to, uh, to be free, and to be free. Well, thank you, Dr. Copeland. We've reached the end of our time together today. Thank you so much for your presentation. And I want to share the, the thanks and praise from the Q&A as well. People, I think, were really moved by, by your presentation today. So thank you. Thank you all very much for listening. I deeply appreciate it. Yes, and thank you to our audience members for joining us today. Uh, this concludes our webinar for today, and we hope that you'll join us for our fall events. Take care. Run, 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 run. You know you got a right. Whoa, 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 you got a right. Whoa, whoa, you got a right. Yes, you got a right. Got a right. To the tree. Run, Mary, run, because you got a right to the tree of life. Run, run Mary, run, Mary, oh, no, run, 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 you run, run, Mary, run, run, run because hey, you got a right to the tree of life. Run, run Mary, run, Mary, oh, no, run, 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 Mary, run, because you got a right to the tree of life. Run, Mary, run, oh, run, To the tree of life, we've been married. You gotta ride. You gotta ride to the tree of life. Oh, all God's children, you gotta ride now. You gotta ride to the tree of life. Ways long, but you gotta ride. You gotta ride to the tree of life. The cross is heavy, but you gotta ride. You gotta ride to the. Oh, won't you run? Oh, yes, now run, run. Mary, run, run. Mary, I oh, said now.